Some OET candidates struggle with OET speaking because they lack fundamental spoken English skills. By knowing how you're scored on your spoken English skills, you can improve your OET speaking score. Okay, before we begin, make sure you hit that subscribe button for high quality OET preparation videos, and while you're there, click like as well. Now, in OET speaking, as you probably know, you complete two role plays, and a recording of your performance is sent to two examiners who score you in two main ways. You're scored on your linguistic skills, that is how good your spoken English is, and you're also scored on your clinical communication skills, that is, how well you deal with the patient. When preparing for OET, and especially if you don't have much time, you need to focus on these clinical communication skills. The reason is that they're much easier to improve than your linguistic skills. Make sure you sign up to E2 Test Prep for free by clicking the link in the description below and watch the Clinical Communication Criteria video. This video goes through all 20 of the clinical skills and gives you very quick ways to improve your performance and your score come test day. So keep that clinical skills video in mind and please understand that that video is the fastest way to improve your test scores. Now, as I mentioned, you're also scored on your core spoken language skills as well. So what we're gonna do today is focus on those spoken language skills. We're gonna deep dive into all the different ways you're scored linguistically. Knowing how you're scored will be helpful for you as you prepare for your test and on test day itself, because really, scoring is what it's all about. The OET speaking linguistic criteria consists of four parts, intelligibility, fluency, appropriateness, and grammar and expression. Before we look at intelligibility and all its subparts, let's look at the OET speaking scoring criteria that the examiners use, just so you know how important and relevant each of them are. So these are the criteria or the checklist that the examiners use when they're listening to your role play. You can see each of the criteria across the top, intelligibility, fluency, appropriateness of language, and resources of grammar and expression. Notice that each of these is scored from zero to six. Keep in mind that in order to reach an OET speaking total score of 350, you need to get predominantly scores of five out of six for each of these linguistic criteria, so there's not much room for error. Let's understand what intelligibility means in relation to OET speaking. Intelligibility refers to five main parts, pronunciation, intonation, emphasis, rhythm, and accent. Let's take a close look at how pronunciation affects your OET speaking score. Good pronunciation is all about clarity, but clarity of what? What needs to be clear? Well, the sounds of English need to be clear. So in English, there are 24 consonant sounds. These are sounds that use some part of your mouth, like your lips, teeth, tongue, or throat. In English, there are also 20 vowel sounds. These are sounds that are unimpeded by some part of your mouth. So there are 44 individual sounds or phonemes, but there are also quite a few consonant clusters as well. To be more precise, there are 144 consonant cluster sounds in English. These are sounds that contain two or sometimes three consonants joined together, like br as in brain, sk as in skull, and abd as in abdomen. If you're worried about your pronunciation, subscribe to the E2 English YouTube channel. It has fundamental skill building videos, including videos on English pronunciation. The link is in the description below. Admittedly, pronunciation makes up a large part of spoken English. I mean, it's all the sounds you make, but spoken English is much more than just sounds. Let's understand what is meant by intonation, because you're marked on it in your OET speaking exam as well. Intonation refers to the correct use of rising and falling tone when speaking. In English, we don't just speak in a monotone or flat way. 
It's a very sing-song type of language, and intonation is used to make meaning clear. Check out these uses of intonation when asking questions. They might surprise you. We ask WH questions with a rising and then falling intonation, like, what's your name? What's the medication? When's your operation? How do you spell it? If you're asking for repetition or clarification, we use slightly rising intonation. What was your name again? What was the medication called? When did you say the operation was? Who is that again? If you're asking a yes-no question, notice the rising intonation. Are you hungry? Am I correct? Did you get the medicine? If you're asking either or questions, notice the rising and then the falling intonation. Would you like tea or coffee? Do you agree or disagree? Do you work or are you a student? And if you're giving lists, notice the rising, 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 and then falling intonation. Do you want water, juice, lemonade, or cordial? Do you exercise in the morning, afternoon, or evening? Another way that we use intonation is to express emotion. Here we have three ways of saying great with different intonation. Great, great, great. The first great is neutral, great. The second great is really happy, great. And the third great actually expresses sarcasm, great. That gives you a bit of an idea of how intonation works in English and how it might work in your OET speaking role play. I recommend paying attention to the way it's used, especially in clinical settings, because it can really help to make what you're saying more meaningful and clearer. Let's understand the role of emphasis in OET speaking. Emphasis here refers to stress, but not psychological stress. We use the word stress in linguistics to refer to emphasis, and there are two types. Emphasis in individual words, also called word stress, and emphasis placed on a certain word in a sentence, also called sentence stress. We use emphasis, or stress, to enhance the meaning of what we're saying. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Some languages don't have word stress. Some languages emphasize each syllable or each part of the word equally or place particular emphasis on one syllable only. In English, it's different. Take a look at this. You can see words with one syllable, pill, nurse, blood. So there's no real word stress here. You just say the single syllable sound. But look at the next set of words. Doctor, pressure, patient. These words have emphasis or word stress on the first syllable. Now compare those words to the next set of words. Acute, prescribe, disease. This time, the emphasis or stress is on the second syllable. And then you have words like allergy, hospital, and ambulance. These words have three syllables, and the stress is on the first syllable. Finally, you have words that have emphasis or stress on the middle syllable. Allergic, reaction, discomfort. So this type of word stress is particular to English. In your first language, you may also use word stress like this. It's a bit like Morse code. Or your first language might just stress the first syllable of all words. Or you might come from a language background where there is equal stress on all syllables. In English, getting the word stress right is important because it helps to convey meaning. Let me show you what I mean. So the words on the left have emphasis or stress on the first syllable. And the words on the right have emphasis or stress on the second syllable. Listen to me say them. Present present, content, content, permit, permit, record, record, suspect, suspect. Do you know what's happening here? Well, all the words on the left are nouns, things, 
and the words on the right with the emphasis on the second syllable are all verbs, doing words. So you can see that word stress actually changes the type of word as well. So let's say this sentence. I had an allergic reaction, so an ambulance took me to hospital. The doctors gave me a pill. Can you hear the word stress? Can you hear which syllable was emphasized? It's a bit tricky, especially if this is a new concept to you, and especially if you don't have word stress in your first language. But you can see the various word stresses used on allergic, reaction, ambulance, hospital, doctors, and pill. So we've talked about word stress or emphasizing a particular syllable in a word, but what about sentence stress, where you emphasize a particular word in a sentence? Let's take a look. By emphasizing a different word or phrase within a sentence, I can direct the speaker's attention to the specific part of the sentence I want them to concentrate on. This is called sentence stress. Listen to these three sentences and notice the shift in emphasis on the nouns. The nurse will provide you with an information leaflet at the front desk. The nurse will provide you with an information leaflet at the front desk. The nurse will provide you with an information leaflet at the front desk. So hopefully you're now beginning to see how complex spoken English is and what it's made of. It has a lot of ingredients, that's for sure. Before we move on and talk about rhythm, I want to talk to you about the importance of taking a speaking mock test with E2 and getting feedback from an expert teacher. If you sign up to any of our paid packages on e2language.com, you can take a speaking mock test. Our teachers are OET experts and will simulate what it's like to take an OET role play and then they will give you comprehensive feedback on your speaking performance, including both the linguistic criteria and the clinical criteria, so you know exactly what to focus on before test day. I can't recommend getting speaking feedback enough before test day. Plus, the experience of doing a role play will really help you out in terms of nervousness and, of course, scoring. Now, in OET speaking, you're also scored on rhythm as well. Rhythm in English refers to the regularity of the stressed syllables. I'm just going to show you how this works. Let's work through these sentences. Notice how the same duration of time is used to say each sentence, even though each sentence gets longer and longer. This is what rhythm is in English. Doctors cure disease. The doctors cure disease. The doctors have cured disease. The doctors have cured the disease. The doctors have been curing disease. The doctors have been curing the disease. So you can probably see that the grammatical words, the articles, auxiliary verbs, and modal verbs are all de-emphasized, while the important words, the content or meaningful words, the nouns and verbs keep their emphasis. Let's talk about accent in OET speaking. So is accent a problem in OET speaking? Which accent do you need? Do you need to sound like a native English speaker? If so, an Australian, a New Zealander, a South African, a British person, an American? The answer is accent is not a problem. There are as many accents as there are people in the world. Everyone's accent is different. But accent can become a problem if your accent affects your pronunciation. Let me show you what I mean. So remember that I told you that there are 20 vowel sounds in English. Here they are. Well, if you're from this part of the world, South India, and you speak Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada, or Telugu, you probably have some sort of interference or challenge when saying these particular English vowel sounds. Why? Because you don't have these vowel sounds in your first language, and therefore, they're a little bit unnatural for you. So again, accent is fine, but you need to be particularly careful of sounds in English that you don't have in your first language. If your first language kind of impedes or makes these particular sounds unclear, then that can be problematic. Remember one thing, you need to be easily understood. If there is strain on part of the listener, then that's an issue. 
Let's understand what fluency means and how it relates to your OET speaking score. So fluency refers to two main things, the rate at which you speak or the tempo and the flow of your speech. Let's take a close look at speech rate. Speech rate is very simple in OET speaking. Don't speak too fast and don't speak too slowly. You need to be mindful of your speech rate. Has anyone ever told you that you speak too quickly? If so, then you might need to slow down on test day. Speed does not equal fluency. And if you find yourself speaking quickly when you're nervous, then you need to make double sure to be conscious of slowing down during the role plays. Let's talk about flow of speech and how this relates to OET speaking. So your flow of speech relates to how continuously and smoothly you speak. Of course, pausing and hesitating are normal parts of spoken speech, but your pauses and hesitations need to be situationally appropriate rather than a sign of searching for words or grammatical structures. If you're hesitating and pausing because you're searching for language, then that's a problem and points to an issue with your vocab and grammar. You also want to be mindful of what's called false starts. That is restarting sentences because you can't get the sentence structure right. You also want to be conscious of fillers, of too many ums and ahs. Some are completely normal and fine on test day, but don't overdo them. Let's talk about appropriateness in OET speaking. Appropriateness refers to two things, comprehensibility and tone. Let's understand how being comprehensible affects your OET speaking score. Comprehensibility means how well you are understood when explaining complicated or technical medical procedures or conditions. You see, in OET speaking, you're speaking to a patient who is a lay person. You can safely assume that the patient doesn't understand any medical jargon. You do, and that's fine, but what's the point of using technical medical language if the person you're speaking to doesn't understand it? What you need to do on test day is make sure that your explanations are simplified so that the patient understands them. This may require you to rethink your understanding and express it in a different way that is comprehensible or understandable to the patient. Simple as that. If we look at our OET speaking scoring criteria, you can see that to get six out of six for appropriateness, you need to explain technical matters in lay terms or simply. Let's talk about tone in OET speaking. Tone means that you adopt a tone of voice suitable to the situation and suitable to the patient with the flexibility to adapt as necessary. Sometimes you'll use a soft tone when expressing empathy, for example, and sometimes you'll use a harsher tone when negotiating with a patient who might be stubborn. You always need to be polite no matter what. That is, the words you use should always be polite, but the pitch and tone of your voice can and should change to express meaning more clearly. Take a look at this role play card and notice the key verbs and how you might shift your tone to achieve certain aims. Find out. Here, you will use a rising tone to ask questions. Request. Here, your tone will be inquiring. Explain. Here, your tone will be strong and clear. Highlight. Here, you will need to use your tone to emphasize something that's critically important. The patient will really need to pay attention. Reassure. Here, your tone will soften. Suggest. Here, your tone will rise slightly. Let's discuss the use of grammar and expression in OET speaking. All right, so how does your use of grammar and expression or grammar and vocab affect your OET speaking score? Well, let's break it down. There are actually six parts to grammar and expression that we need to look at. Depth, range, flexibility, complexity, accuracy, and idiomaticity. Let's talk about the depth of your grammar and expression. Okay, so if you have a really complete ability to use English grammar and vocab, what you say will be unambiguous. That is, 
what you say will only be able to be interpreted in a single way. If your grammar and expression are not so good, what you say might be ambiguous. That is, what you say might be misinterpreted because it's not particularly clear. Here's an example of ambiguous and unambiguous language. Let's consider this sentence. Take the tooth out of the mouth and fix it. Fix what? The tooth or the mouth? This sentence is ambiguous. The grammar is correct, but it has two meanings because the sentence has poor grammar or poor pronoun reference. And here's a joke that illustrates ambiguous language. This time it's the doctor misinterpreting the patient. So the patient says, I broke my arm in two places. And the doctor says, well, don't go to those two places. Did you get the joke? Anyway, be conscious of ambiguous language in real life and try to avoid using it. When you say something, you want it to be interpreted the way that you mean and not misinterpreted because of a lack of understanding of meaning or poor grammatical choices. Let's talk about grammatical range and OET speaking. Knowing and being able to use a wide range of grammar and vocab means you'll be able to express yourself clearly. If you have a limited vocab and grammatical range, then your ideas are going to be constrained and your meaning will be less clear. It's as simple as that. Let's talk about flexibility in OET speaking. In OET speaking, it's critical to be able to paraphrase. That is, you need to have the ability to repeat back what the patient has said in different words or explain something in several different ways. Repetition and varied expression are examples of paraphrasing and the OET examiners will be listening to your performance to see if you can paraphrase effectively. In order to be able to paraphrase, you need a wide range of vocabulary and grammar and the ability to express yourself in different ways or in a word, be flexible. Now, let's say you, as the medical professional, want to repeat back what the patient has said. It would be strange if you repeated what the patient said in the exact same words that the patient used. What usually happens is that you paraphrase or repeat back what was said using different words, such as, so you've been getting headaches daily for the last week? You don't have to consciously paraphrase. If your vocab and grammar are sufficient, you will naturally differ your repetition because you can't remember exactly what the patient said anyway. But to put it all together, being flexible is critical. Let's talk about complexity in OET speaking. OET speaking is all about clarity and clarity often means simplicity. But sometimes you'll need to use some complex language to express something. As we've already discussed, you should always avoid complex medical jargon, but sometimes you'll need to explain something to a patient, perhaps a condition or a procedure, that will naturally require some quite complex or sophisticated general vocab and grammar. Another way to think about complexity is that you just can't speak in short, simple sentences. Sometimes you'll need a compound sentence, sometimes a complex sentence, oftentimes a question, or a sentence with a modal verb, etc. Being able to express complex ideas is important. Let's talk about idiomaticity in OET speaking. Okay, I'm sure you've all heard English idioms such as fit as a fiddle or kick the bucket or a picture of health. These are all lovely little idioms, but this is not what I'm talking about and they're not what the OET examiners are listening for. Please don't jam any proverb style idioms into your discussion. The types of idioms I'm talking about are ones like these, very common little English phrases. Kind of, of course, in fact, deal with, at all, as well, come up, find out, according to. These are the types of idiomatic phrases that you need to use, and the list goes on. There are heaps of them, but notice how none of these phrases actually make any sense in and of themselves. They lack meaning. That's why they're idioms. They have meaning, but only in context. Recap. So what have we learned in this lesson? We've learned a lot. We've learned that you're scored in OET speaking on linguistic criteria, which we've just gone through in this video, 
and you're also scored on clinical communication criteria, which are much simpler if you want to improve your score rapidly. Let me remind you of how important this video is on the E2 test prep platform on the clinical communication criteria skills. By watching this video, you can boost your scores quickly. Click the link in the description below to sign up for free. Okay, so the video we just did was pretty complicated and I hope it hasn't scared you. If you practice and then you relax on test day, I'm sure you'll be fine. My name is Jay and I'll see you soon.